video podcasting to you from a field here in beautiful rural Ireland. I'm Trev Denny, and this is Molby on the Spot, your, well, I'd like to say weekly, but it's been a while, chance to catch up with the Liverpool and Denmark legend that is Jan Molby as we look back on what's been going on for the Reds. So, uh, for the first time in a while, good evening, Jan. Good evening, Trevor. It is now a yearly show. <laughs> it is, we do yeah, we do it once every year. Uh, it's It's been a, a very interesting layoff. Obviously, the World Cup was not uh, of great significance to us from a Liverpool point of view, except for maybe some of the setbacks that we had during that period in terms of injuries and things like that. Uh, but the weeks since then, holy, holy hell, a lot has been happening. And uh, I, people have been very specific, specifically asking to get your take on things. So... I want to look back on that period, but let's address the elephant in the room at the moment first, because um, I remember in one of the shows we did before we finished up for the break there, one of the co- topics of conversation, Jan, was um, where's your optimism levels at? Because things weren't great at that time and they continue to be not great. Um, and a lot of people, from what I can see, are starting to really... Uh, lose faith on a level that I haven't seen for years. Um, There's a a tremendous amount of pessimism about. Um, And honestly, I I can relate to some of it. um, And I can, I find myself pushing back against people who are blindly saying everything will be okay. I think as often is the case, the truth is somewhere in the middle. But I'd I'd be very, very anxious at the start of the show to get a feel for where you are with all of this on a general kind of a way at the moment? I, I think, Trev, it, it appears like the whole thing is in a, in a massive decline, doesn't it? Mm. Uh, you, you, you try and remain positive. You try and find reason why things will be OK. And the one thing we can always lean up against is the fact that this group of players have done so well over the years. And you think something will trigger our season, we'll, we'll, we'll make a comeback. And I'm finding less and less reason to think of what is going to trigger uh, our season. Uh, it's more or less affecting every single player we've got. I mean, the last player to be caught up in it, it's been our best player this season, which is the goalkeeper, Allison, uh, was also caught up in it against against Wolves. And so I'm kind of more or less thinking that there isn't an imminent fix. Uh, also, I don't believe it's as bad as some people make it out to be. Uh, Top four is, is 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 our only target now, Trevor. I still believe we'll be strong in the Champions League, but top four in the Premier League is our target, isn't it? You know, it's it's a good job that some of the others are having a massive wobble, and I'm thinking of the likes of Spurs and Chelsea, uh, because we're, we're, we're not doing enough ourselves either. You know, I've been lucky or unfortunate, whatever way you want to call it. You know, I was, I was, I was at most of the Liverpool games over Christmas. Uh, and... There's so many worrying signs, I have to be honest, so many worrying signs. You see, that's it, isn't it? It's the it's the fine line between being um, depressed about it all and trying to maintain some sort of level of sanity. If you look at the league record, we had four wins in a row until that most recent setback. And I suppose that maybe tempers uh, too much throwing out of the toys out of the pram. But I see what you're saying there, Jan, about signs, and I think most people can see it. And I think most people who are maybe enjoying is the wrong word, but who are pleased that Liverpool are getting wins on the board in those four games before the last one, were also seeing the signs in those games because we were very vulnerable. You, you, you'd have to be in tremendous denial to say that we weren't quite vulnerable and exposed and very open looking in a way that we haven't been before. Um, most of the focus has been on the midfield and Jurgen tried to deflect away from that. I think in an understandable way, in one of his most recent press conferences, it was put directly to him about the issues around the midfield. And he tried to say, well, it's not just the midfield, it's the whole team thing that defending begins from the front, all of that. You would expect him to do that. He's a a loyal man. Uh, He's loyal to his group of players. And he's also not going to want to be painted into a corner that he's mismanaged an area of the team development. But what a lot of people are saying, Jan, is that whatever the reasons, let's not get into it because you and I can't really say whether well, you would have more of a, a, an idea than I would, but probably it's, can't say definitively whether the theory about Pep Linder's influence is, has anything to it. Whether 
the back room situation with the ownership is playing into it in terms of budget availability, whether Jurgen is actually frustrated or not, because he's not like Rafa Benitez. He's not going to come out and say that he's going to play the game and be a team player as long as he thinks it's worth being that. So we can guess all day about what the reasons for the issues are, but they're undeniable. And the most obvious way they manifest themselves, Jan, is on the park in that openness. How do you explain that? Because I heard a couple of people of merit in the uh, uh, journalism world and ex-pros like yourself basically coming to the conclusion that we are knackered. Does that hold any um, any uh, water with you as a theory? I mean, that's, that's a very, very difficult issue, isn't it? Are, are the players tired? Are they not playing? I don't know. I mean, I thought somebody wrote after the Brentford game, I think about Harvey Elliott and said the boy looks like he needs a rest. And then you think, well, he's just had six weeks off during the World Cup and whatever. But it's never as simple as that, is it? Uh, I believe that. And I believe it'll, it will happen to most teams as the season now goes on. There'll be a certain amount of tiredness. You know, I think that when, when when the Premier League returned after the World Cup and it sort of came back with a bit of a bang, didn't it? It's in the day, 20 something bang, bang, and people go, the World Cup has had no impact, but the World Cup will have an impact. The World Cup had an impact pre-World Cup and it'll also have a, an impact after the World Cup and it'll come to clubs at different stages. Are we tired? Yeah, but I don't think we're permanent tired in that. I don't think we'll ever be able to find our feet again. I think we'll be able to find our legs again. It's just to what extent? Uh, we still play. Like every single one of our players is at the peak of their powers. And I think that's a big mistake, isn't it? You know, we're playing open, we're squeezing up, we're, we're expecting our midfield players to do things that they did two, three years ago when they were at, at their ax, absolute maximum, isn't it? And I just think that, and I've been very protective about the way that we play because I think that the way that we've chosen to play has been a big part of our success squeezing up, keeping the opposition away from our box and whatever, isn't it? Uh, and I've been very reluctant to, and that was kind of the last thing I wanted to go to because that's how we play, isn't it? But I think that if we're going to carry on playing with the players we have, which we've got no choice of it, then I think we have to play differently. We, we cannot carry on playing the way that we're playing, where we even saw the Wolves on Saturday night, uh, a depleted Wolves team who made a lot of changes, but he runs straight through us. We saw it with Leicester when it came to Anfield, a depleted Leicester within five minutes, they run straight through the middle of, 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 of our team. And that can't be right. We, we, we've got to find a solution of stopping that. It's easy, you know, to put the blame on. But the, the midfield is a big issue. And Manchester City, Man, sorry, Manchester United had a, an issue with a defensive midfield player ever since Carrick uh, retired. They, they've now solved that with Casemiro. And, and look what that does. You get one player who's the right player in a key position and you change things. So that comes back to Fabinho. Where's he at? Again, I don't know. He certainly looks tired. He looks like he can't pick his feet up. He looks like he can't do what he used to be able to do, isn't it? So so that is an issue. Uh, but it's an issue, Trevor, that we're not close enough to be able to 100% judge. We can only go with what we see. Uh, and the easy solution is to, to say that they're tired. But I don't believe we're more tired than, than maybe some of the other squads, you know. But, so we, we, we've tried to defend Jürgen with, with the midfield situation and I, I'm not suggesting it comes back to him, but maybe he needed to be more forceful in certain situations and go, listen, we, we, we can't carry on without Wijnaldum going and not really replacing him, Trevor. You know, it's, I know at the time we thought he goes with our blessing, he's done really well here and we'll be able to replace him, isn't it? But when you look at those three, Fabinho, Wijnaldum and Henderson at their absolute best, nightmare to play against. Now, you kind of look and you think, I can't wait to get in there and have a go with these, you know. And that's, I mean, we've always been horrible to play against, you know, horrible to play against in so many different ways, isn't it? Now, it's almost enjoyable to play against us, isn't it? Because you know you'll get opportunities. And that is apparently um, a story during last week, towards the end of last week, that was apparently the uh judgment of someone on the backroom staff of a Premier League rival who, who said, yeah, well, Liverpool are currently the team that everybody fancies their chances against because you can get at them because they don't like the physical battle. And, 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 and as you say, 
ironically, on the back of um, a certain book, um, we seem to have lost that intensity. We seem to have lost that identity. Uh, I think it's inarguable. I'm sure Jurgen will push back against that because he has to. But it's clear as, as the nose on everybody's face that that's what's going on at the moment. It's it's difficult to watch. It's painful to watch. I think you'll agree with me there. It's probably why it maybe seems a little bit... Um, I'm very aware of, 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 you know, compared to the fans of other clubs being too much of a moan. Um, you know, I'm very aware of the fact that, like, you know, here we are saying we didn't uh, we didn't win the last game and we drew the game afterwards and now, you know, wah, wah. But in the games we were winning, these things were, were evident. Um, if you look at that midfield area for a second with me because we can't escape the fact that we're in this transfer window and uh, there is an opportunity to at least address it uh, temporarily. Now, the last thing we need is another Arthur uh, type signing because that poor bastard, uh, I mean, what terrible luck that kid had. And honestly, does anyone really believe he was going to be the answer to everybody's prayers anyway? Who knows? But we do have the opportunity to address this thing. And um, top four, Jan, we're seven points off it. It's not an easy thing. Chelsea are behind us. They could rally. They're, sign they're about to sign about 79 players in this window. Um, it seems almost like it would be that word again, negligent to not do it. Um, you look at something like the Matias Nunes situation, that's kind of annoying, isn't it? When you hear that we're back in for him, having had the opportunity, surely we would have had a far greater opportunity to take him than Wolves at the time. Um, these stories, you can understand, rattle people and, 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 and get them anxious. If you had to call it, would you say there's a fair likelihood that there will be something done in the way of a midfield signing in this uh, window? Do you, do you think it'll be a splashy one or do you think it'll be just a functional, maybe even a, an opportunistic loan or something? Well, there's a couple of issues, Trevor. And, and one is obviously to do with the ownership of the club, although I'm less led to believe that they design trying to sell the whole club. I, I do believe that trying to sell a percentage of the club to get some investment, isn't it? One thing we do know uh, is that short-term solutions were very polite. You know, when, when, when we're being forced to do something that's not in our long-term planning, uh, i.e. when we had to sign the two centre-halves or even going back to Jurgen Klopp when he came and we signed Stephen Corker. You know, all little things like Arthur Mellor was, was not part of anything we wanted to do, was it? And if we're going to sign... We've signed Cody Gakpo. He was part of our long-term plan. He wasn't part of our long-term plan in January, but we were forced to for every reason to do it now, isn't it? Should we sign a midfield player? I do believe that the only midfield player who's 100% part of our long-term plan is Jude Bellingham. Uh, and, and, and whether that transfer gets any further away from us, uh, result by result, again, I, I don't know. I've got a feeling listening to the boy and his camp and whatever, I think he quite fancies coming back to England, the Premier League. You know, and, and when you come back, Liverpool is still a big club, isn't it? You know, it still has something magical that might just tempt a miss. And so I don't know about that. Uh, we, we were strongly linked with the uh, with the, with the uh, Moroccan boy who had such a good World Cup, Amrabat. Uh, and, and, and he's maybe more something you look at and go, you, you can't really go wrong here, I think. You know, he's the right age, sort of 24, 25. The fee is where he needs to be, you know. We're not being overly charged, what we call Premier League tax. We're not overly being charged by, you know, a certain amount of desperation in January, isn't it? You know what I mean? So maybe that would make a bit of sense. You, you mentioned the boy at Wolves before Nunez, who, who looks a good player. I don't know whether that's possible or not, whether he's, when he can actually play for three different clubs in a season, you know. Uh, so there's some issues there, isn't there? Uh, so, but it is interesting. So ask me, I would say highly unlikely. Uh, that we're going to do anything. But what do we know, Trevor? We, we saw the Cody Gakpo came from, from absolutely nowhere. We think, wow, uh, we got that done quick, whether it was what we needed or not, uh, because we can go back and say, could we have spent that money better elsewhere? Uh, but as I said before, he was part of our long-term plan. We brought him in. I'm sure given time, he'll he'll be absolutely fine. Is the Our main concern at the moment is, is, is our midfield, absolutely our midfield. 
Well, look, we'll, we'll end up circling back to that one way or the other because you can't avoid it in terms of just... You know, you mentioned the book before. Yeah. We, we spoke about the book, didn't we? Yeah. I sort of kind of dismissed it a bit. Do you think there was almost like a certain amount of arrogance about, you know, the fact that he was a current member of the first team staff and we sort of went, this is what we got. How are you going to deal with our intensity, our unpredictability? We'll, we'll give it to you, you know. I, I, what do you, I mean, you're a bright boy, Trevor. What do you think? Well, I, I, I was going to, I was going to spin it around and say, can you imagine in your era, uh, Roy Evans, Ronnie Moran, come out with a book talking about the Liverpool way, right? That's how that's that was the big phrase back in the day, wasn't it? The Liverpool way. There was a whole era or aura of mystery about it. Everyone wondered what it was. People would all, oh, I'm sure, how many times have you been asked that question, that daft question in interviews? What is the Liverpool way, Jan? And you've no doubt said, well, we do small sided training games. Well, what do you want? I don't fucking know. What's the Liverpool way? Um, but can you imagine Ronnie or Roy coming out with a book like that? Fucking no way. Not a chance. Because like you said, it's that arrogance, that hubris. You just, it wouldn't be okay. And I think it's a book that you write looking back. It is not a book that you write when you're trying to write a wave and hopefully get even better. Uh, at the end of the day, Jan, this team that we've enjoyed so much, I mean, I don't want to, I'm just going to say what I'm feeling in the moment, which is we've lost a lot of fucking big games. You know, there are two Champions Leagues that we left on the table. There are at least two leagues that we left on the table. And I'm a greedy bastard when it comes to being a fan. I want as many trophies as possible for the club that I've supported all my life. That's what I want. That's why we're all in this, surely. And it's lovely. And I've enjoyed the hell out of this run. And I can roll with it if, we're, if I feel like we're improving. I don't. Uh, at the moment, I feel like there's a stagnation and I think everybody can see that. And so absolutely, I think that factors in. There's no way that book gets written at, at a different era during Liverpool's time. And I think it's a it's a misstep. And what it is, yeah, at the end of the day, is it's just a lovely metaphor for the bullshit that we find ourselves in now at the moment where people are looking at us and scratching their heads and saying, what are you? And I think, and I don't know what you think about this, I get the feeling that maybe the manager is doing the same thing. Uh, Paul Joyce in his article today said, Klopp hasn't lost the dressing room. It's just that the players can no longer do the things that he wants them to do. And I have to say, I mean, I'm not one for quoting journalists usually, but that makes sense to me. I mean, as a concept, that makes sense to me. Um, that whether it's tiredness or lads aging out or not having the required personnel because we allowed the squad to stagnate a bit, they cannot do clap ball the way that he wants them to do it. That makes sense to me as a theory. What do you reckon to that? I totally agree. Uh, I always thought that we would we would have enough in in in, in terms of being able to almost not be affected by what is happening now. I always thought we'll have, we'll have we, we've got too many great players. You know, if you look back three, four years ago and we're going through who had the best goalkeeper in the world, you know, we definitely had the, the one in the top three, didn't we? But we had the best centre half in the world. We probably had the best set of full backs and blah, blah, whatever. You go through all them think, yeah, okay. At some stage, something will happen to these group of players, isn't it? But we got too much quality for it to sort of fall away. And I think last season was probably a perfect example of that, in that we hung on in there, didn't we, and almost did the unthinkable, isn't it? Uh, but all that, what I held on to, all that quality, I thought, well, if Fabinho can't do what he does, he will just sit and still be a great player. Uh, and we're getting exposed everywhere. And I just never, I just always thought, and the easiest team to compare with, because it's the most recent, was United, when they got sort of around 2010-11, and you look and you're thinking, these are coming to the end. But, but, but through sheer quality, they still found a way, didn't they, with gigs and skulls and whatever, isn't it? You know what I mean? And I thought we would fall into that same category. I understand that the game's changed. 
and he's a lot more athletic than he ever was, isn't it? But I still thought that we'll have too much to fall in to that hole, but we fall into that hole. And I'm not sure this group of players can 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 get us out of that hole and back to where we want to be each other. Talk to me a bit about um, Harvey Elliott, because there's a lot of talk about him and everyone who has any sort of sense about them at all can see that this is a comparative child and to be singling him out as the reason for X, Y or Z is it, it's idiotic. However, he is being played in a position by the manager, which in my own uh completely uh, worthless uh, opinion compared to, to, to the likes of, your, of yourself. I don't think Harvey Elliott's a midfielder. I never have. I don't understand what it is that Jurgen sees in him as a clock number eight with the ability to press uh, and, and, and uh, cover at the same time. It appears to me that the big, you mentioned Wijnaldum earlier on, it appears to me that the biggest loss that we've had is someone to uh, cut out passing lanes, someone to make interceptions and blocks, someone to carry the ball in transition, hold the ball, stick his arse out, make sure that we retain possession and keep it chugging along like that. We know Fabinho can do that on his day. But you need another, a another in there. Tiago can do that on his day as well. And if you have Tiago and Fab at top, top uh, uh, pace, then you need another competent midfielder in there as well. It used to be Henderson would supply the high energy. Um, no doubting Harvey Elliott's energy, but to bring it back to him for a second. I mean, the kid is a wonderful talent and we can see that. I mean, he's brave on the ball. He, uh, that, uh, that always impresses me, how willing he is to take the ball in difficult situations and the things he can do with it when he gets them. But I think it's cruel to the kid to keep playing him there. He started the season in this position. He's the he's played more minutes than anybody else in the first team. That's in and, in and of itself, I'm sorry, that's bananas and it speaks to the dearth of midfield quality that we've got. And it's almost like the issue in a nutshell. Surely Harvey should be getting minutes along the lines or maybe a bit more uh, that Carvalho is getting, where he's coming on and having 15 minutes or 20 minutes here when we're on top or towards the end of a match and getting to do his thing and then maybe holding on to one of the wide positions for the next day. That's where I would have thought he would be. But but he's been asked to do so much, and yeah, and I I don't actually think he has the skill set to do it, especially against when he's playing alongside a, a, a Henderson who's off his game and a Fab who's off his game. It's a big ask for the kid. What what do you think about the whole Elliot situation? I, I don't know how you look at players, Trevor, and, and whether you just look and go, he's a good player, he's not a good player. Uh, but but I also look at players and I go, he's a physical player, and physical player doesn't nef- doesn't mean you're physical in that, but the physical element of the game is your strength, whether that's running, running at high speed and whatever. And I also look at players and I go, he's a tactical player and he's not a tactical player. You know, I look at Javier Elliott and I'm thinking he's not a tactical player. He's a footballer. He's an off the cuff player. He wants to play. He wants to join in. And he gets seduced by the beautiful things about the game, doesn't he? Mm. Mm. Yeah. yeah. He wants to play little one-twos and getting goals and being involved. Yeah, because that's his personality, isn't it? So he's not a tactical footballer. Whereas when you look at almost all of our other midfield players, they're all tactical footballers, aren't they? Henderson and Fabinho and Thiago and whoever, Milner, they're all tactical footballers. But, but, but for Harvey, he's not. You know, and, and, and I think, like you rightly say, you put him in that team two years ago when we had all that in control and you're just totally different boy, isn't it? Uh, so the biggest problem we got is that, A, he's been asked to play in a position, like you said before, he doesn't have the tools to, to play that position. And, but more importantly, He's been asked to play too often. And he's also been asked to almost sometimes come in and rescue us, isn't he? You know what I mean? We're not we stick Harvey back in, isn't it? Is that is that the answer? I mean, prop well, we, we know now it's not, isn't it? You know what I mean? Harvey Elliott at the moment isn't the answer to any of the problems we got in midfield. That doesn't stop him from being a very good player, isn't it? But he's not the answer to the problems we got in midfield. People were flashing back to where he had a fantastic spell in that position uh, pre- in the previous season. And what they're missing, I think, these people, is that the people around him were performing at a higher level, both behind him, ahead of him, and around him in midfield. And perhaps then 
some of the exposure is sort of curtailed in that regard. But when you have other people not at it, um, and you have a team that's not regularly featuring um, Bobby Firmino, who does such brilliant work in terms of that thing that Ian Rush sort of um, patented years ago in terms of defending from the front. It, it It's a knock-on effect in terms of pressure. And so it kind of brings us around to the question that, again, the other elephant in the room is, what do we do about it? Now, we won't get into wild speculation because honestly, there's so many shows who do that and I don't want to be putting you on the spot and asking you about um, players who we may or may not be linked with. But there's a trend I want to just kind of point out to you. The story started about Enzo Fernandez, who had a fantastic World Cup and looks to be a, a class act. And then all of a sudden we were priced out of it because Chelsea were throwing more money at it than anybody else. The Bellingham story started and all of a sudden we were being priced out of it because he's right really at the top end of the, the ballpark as well. And uh, City had more money and Real had more money and they were being linked. Uh, Caicedo was the next one that we were linked with uh, on a regular, regular basis. I'd have sort of probably, if I was a betting man, had a little flutter on that at the, at the start of this window. Uh, but it appears now Chelsea are pricing us out of that one as well. There's a trend there that I don't like the sound of. And you hear these little quotes coming from the in the know journalists talking about Liverpool are done or they're waiting for the correct opportunity. And we have a big war chest for the summer, blah, blah, blah. That, those kind of things drive people insane. And um, I think that's understandable because nobody wants to be putting stuff on hold. But as you look around at potential gets, including those big guys um, that we've mentioned there, do, does anyone seem an obvious fit? Um, there was talk of this Kone kid as well. And there are probably other younger lads around. I think, is it is it Moussa Diaby as well? There are a couple of other, other lads in the French and German leagues where you could probably get them for reasonable fees and possibly even now. Um, and again, I ask you the question, do you think that's something we need to do now? Or... How does it sit with you, the idea of sort of letting this season sort of drift away um, with the assurance that there are going to be certain lads coming in? Because if, if you're asking me that and we finish seventh, eighth, is Jude Bellingham coming to that club where there's no Champions League? I don't think so. Is Enzo Fernandez coming? I don't think so. So it's, it's a very complex one, Jan. First of all, who do you like the look of? Who do you think suits us? And is there anybody that you've heard tell of that might be sort of a likely candidate, in, even in this window? No, I think, I mean, the Jude Bellingham takes up a lot of the talk. Uh, and a very interesting point was made, and I can't remember whether it was the Villa game or the Brentford game, whatever, in that there's still a lot of respected journalists who are writing about Jude Bellingham potentially coming to Liverpool. Mm. And what happens in those situations, Trevor, is that if the club no longer feels that they're going to get him, they would give those journalists a little nod and go, stop right now. You know, if the club thought that this one has drifted, yeah. So what the journalists are saying to me is the sheer fact that nobody from the club will give us a nuts and go, stop right now. You know, we, 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 so there's still a certain amount of confidence from within the club that we can actually nail him. And should we nail him, uh, then you look and you think, it's, it's, it's obviously, we're not going to be going for anyone else, are we? Uh, well, 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 let me let me let me jump in there because, for, uh, and first of all, do you think that's what happened with Fernandez? That that, that those stories were like the journalists were said, it, yeah, just stop talking about Fernandez because we're out of that bargain now. We're out of that deal now. He's gone too high. You reckon that's what happened there? Yeah, absolutely. And the problem with the Fernandez thing is that Benfica wanted all the money up front. Yeah. You know, sometimes you find Portuguese clubs under pressure to sell. They weren't, and they say this is his fee. You pay it. And, and if not, you can't. I mean, if we go back to Thiago or when we signed Shotter from Wolves, we, we were managed to do those deals with, with minimal uh, outlay to start with. I, I believe we only gave Bayern Munich five million to start with and the same to Wolves, isn't it? Uh, so our owners aren't about to give Benfica over 100 million in one go, and that's what they want, isn't it? So I think the journey has had a little nuts and go, don't waste any more time on that because that's not happening. Uh, and so if... If that's the case there, to go back to the other point that I wanted to jump in there on, on something you said, because I'll forget it otherwise. If Bellingham does happen and there's a confidence around that, 
you followed up there immediately, but there's a, we're unlikely to be able to do anything else because that's going to take a huge portion of our budget. Now, I'm of the opinion uh, personally, and I know several other people on the channel are, that we don't just need one midfielder or two midfielders. We probably need three. So there's an issue, right, straight away. Who's going to go off the midfield players? Yeah. Milner? Yeah. Nappy Keita? Yeah. Possibly. Oxley chamberlain Yeah. You know, so already you're looking. Uh, so you mentioned a couple of boys who are running around in, in, in Germany and France or whatever. Uh, there's two midfield players I really like in the Premier League centre midfield players. One on a place for Fulham, Palfinia. He's 28 and he's only just come into the Premier League. But what a good player he looks. And one boy that Steven Gerrard signed for Aston Villa, Bubakar Kamara. Uh, what a player he looks. You know, if you look, they're, they're already here. Uh, they look like they can cope with it all, you know what I mean? Pafini at, at, at 28 at, at Fulham, probably the wrong age, isn't it? But I'm just thinking there's three, four years in him. I know they paid 25, 28 million for him. We might have to go a bit higher, isn't it? But, you know, you're looking at, they just look really, really good players to me, Trevor. And I know from now on you'll keep an eye on him, you think, you know. Uh, and the, the boy at, at Villa Bubakar, Kamala, he's even younger, you know. So they look really, really good players, isn't it? But I totally agree. Uh, I do believe that. As always, we're scouring the sort of free transfer market and might be able to pick up one or two uh, players from that, isn't it? But is that enough? I mean, two years ago, we were pretty chilled about long. We have a long term plan and it works, doesn't it? We'll wait till the summer, we'll get who we want, isn't it? But we're no longer there. And you mentioned before, shall we just give up? Fuck, oh, another last thing I'd recommend is give up anything, isn't it? You know, no, but it, it is, isn't it, Trevor, because as you said, you give them one thing, then it snowballs onto the next thing, and then before yeah. you know, and before you know, you, you can't get out of it, can you? So you kind of it's it's a bit like where we've been in a position where we've been able to look at other clubs and go look at them, look at them panicking, isn't it? But it's sort of a semi panic, isn't it? But they've been holding on, haven't they? We got to hold on, haven't we? We got to hold on to the, to the to the to that little league in the Premier League where we belong. Which is now top six, top, top seven, isn't it? With, with Newcastle, whatever. But we've got to hold on. We've got to be close to them, and we've got to make sure we're as attractive as they are when when players come available, isn't it? So no, I, I would never ever give up on anything. So is it worth then just to play devil's advocate? Would it be worth our while doing something where we end up playing the Premier League, paying the Premier League tax that you referred to earlier on, and say, all right, Moises Casado. Um, or him, yeah, from the Premier League. Yeah, yeah. So, 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 so Chelsea are willing to offer this. Here's this, and we actually just go big and commit to a player that we know can do it in this league and would be an immediate first teamer for us. Uh, again, look, we're, we're we're speculating, we're theorising, but in in, 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 in the, you've got to be able to sit down with the board, though, haven't you, and go, how much money do you think this is going to cost? Yeah, and they'll go, well, and then you disagree. Because they'll they put it right for 150 million. You go, no, we can't. It'll cost us 250 million. Yeah, we've no longer got sellable assets. Assets. A few years ago, we went bang bang. We haven't anymore because it all comes towards the end, down So it's not as if we can carry on selling sort of squad players, Naby Keita, Oxley, Chamberlain. You know, so we can't we, we can't do that anymore. So you disagree, and you go, well, no, it's going to cost us a quarter of a billion, 250. Yeah, let's start spending now. Let's spend 50, 60 now. If that's what's going to cost you, we to spend it. We might as well spend it now. So, yeah, Casado or whoever it is, let's go and get him. And then we still have the war chest for the summer. Because believe me, as much as they like the business model is sell to buy. But they must know we run out of that. You know, we run out of that possibility of being able to sell players to be able to fund what we need, isn't it? So if it's 250 Let's get on with it. I'm, I'm not necessarily a big fan of spend, 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 spend. And we've been lucky that we, we, we were so well prepared that we didn't have to spend, spend, spend. But we're no longer in that position. You know, and it goes like that all the time, isn't it? Because when you look at the clubs now, now Arsenal are in a good position, aren't they? It's got a really young squad. Uh, so, so they're in the position we were in four or five years ago. Uh, now we're in a position where Spurs and Manchester United find themselves, isn't it? You know what I mean? Where you've got to fight your way out of it. You've got to find your, you fight your way out of it. By making, it's a bit like playing poker. Every now and again, you've got to go all in, you know, and, and, and we're at that stage, isn't it? 
we need to go all in. Look what's sitting on the money. It's not, we we can't afford any longer to go. We we'll wait till the summer and we know exactly what we're doing, and he'll put things right, isn't it? We 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 need to play ball now. It's frustrating for some people because they do start doing sums and they get their little ledgers out and they see carry the four and they see that well, well we've only spent a, so I think kind of mid twenties um, million uh, per season in total net spend or whatever in terms of the sum total of 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 money spent on players versus the money made on players in that period of time. And people see that as being incredibly miserly, considering what we've achieved and what Jurgen has managed to do on that budget. And then the other thing is, you're talking about all in. When we had a good team and Jurgen was starting to establish a team that can get to a Europa League final and get top four, we go all in. We get Ali, we get Virgil, we spend record sums. It's transformative. And again, I think an awful lot of people are feeling, well, imagine if we actually got those couple of cent central midfield players. You might suddenly begin to see Mo Salah playing again, because I don't know what that poor kid is at the moment, but he's a shadow of himself. And, you know, you might start to see it, 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 it frees Darwin Nunes to be a bit more what he can be and so on and so forth. It's that knock on effect again, isn't it, Jan? I, I, except in the positive this time. And we we have evidence. It's like it, it worked before. Like how how can we not see that 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 kind of big gesture works? It's the whole idea of strengthening from a place of strength, like you guys did all the way through the eighties. We win the league. Okay, I'm going to sign even bigger players. We win the league again. We go again. And the first. Uh, um, proper Liverpool quality player that becomes available and wants to move, we get him. And even if he doesn't, we go and we tap him up and we get him. It's that idea of let's uh, take this level rat right here and not ever let it drop. And it feels like things have been let drop, even though last season sort of disguised it. And now it's like the emperor's new clothes. We can all see the issues. You don't have to be a football genius to see where those issues are on the park. And I feel very sorry for Jurgen because I think he's in a hopeless position because everything he says is going to wind people up, whether he's positive or negative. He can't win. Um, I feel sorry for the players having to do interviews afterwards. They can't win. Nobody wants to hear them saying, well, we, we, we go again, whatever. It's just a difficult situation. And to me, it calls for a responsible sort of ownership to come in and say, here, let's, here's the grand gesture. Uh, I have to say, Jan, if I was to, again, go and, and carry some money down to my local betting shop, I don't think I'd put a big bet on that happening, though. Not in this window. No, I, I, I find it difficult to see that as well. I mean, you mentioned Jürgen. Jürgen's biggest strength is he's, he's a team player, isn't he? He's very much a team player. So for as long as he's in Chelsea Liverpool Football Club, he will always stick up for what we're doing, isn't it? Uh, so it, it comes back on the owners, isn't it? It comes back on the owners probably getting, I don't know whether they got arrogant or carried away, but we did a lot of things from a position of strength and we got deals done on our terms. Uh, and that was mainly because a lot of the players wanted to come to our club, isn't it? So we were in a position. And I don't know whether the owners thought that this could continue. But he can't in football, can it, Trevor? Nothing can continue. You, you, you won't be able to always get the players two days before they reach the top because that's what we were doing when we were getting Mo Salah just and we were getting Sadio Mane just, isn't it? And you can't expect that to happen. Things don't work like that. And at some stage, we will have to act like other clubs do. You know where we've been saying, oh, they did, they... We will have to do exactly the same. Because that's how it works in this world, isn't it? You have your really good moments and you have your difficult moments, isn't it? But you've got to be prepared to, to fight during both of them. And even when we had our good periods, did, did we fight enough to, like you said before, to stay here and never drop be, be, be below that level? I mean, I speak to some players that I played with or some players that played before me who were let go. And still to this very day, they go, we won the league, we won the European Cup, and they let me go. And I go, yeah, but what happened subsequently? They carried on winning, you know, and, and, and that's the key, isn't it? You know? It really is. It really is. And, you know, I'm 
when you're speaking about that, just to focus on something that has a potential for positivity, what have you made of uh, GACPO? Uh, obviously, there's no sample size there to look at, really. But do you feel as if we're looking at a player there who is going to um, fit right in? I, I'm, I'm casting my mind back to various debuts that we've seen. I think the first time we all saw Luis Diaz, say, for example, we were going, oh, this guy's, this guy's got it. Uh, Diaz debut in some ways reminded me of Dirk Kout's debut and that it was everyone on the ground was just going yeah this guy's great this guy's great he's 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 what we're looking for um I don't know that there was that magic about the Gakpo debut but I can see that he looks a tidy footballer I spoke to a Dutch football expert for the channel there and he reckons just to continue on the vein that's what inspired the question that you were talking about he reckons we're catching him at the exact right time in his career where he is just on this upward curve maximizing everything turning into a goal scorer provider he can go from the the, the flank to playing 10 for the dutch team that we are just getting this guy at the height of his powers or emerging into them i suppose that's something to be optimistic about he he, he looks potentially a very good player uh, he's not as explosive as as uh, Diaz uh, because Diaz just came in from, and you went, wow, what is this all about? You know what I mean? Gakpo is, is, is slightly different, isn't it? But I agree with you. I think he can play all three positions uh, through the through the front line, uh, f- front three, sorry. And we have got him at the right time because he isn't there yet. You know, he was an outstanding standout performer in the uh, Eredivisie division in in Holland, isn't it? But he's not ready to be a standout performer in the Premier League as of yet. But he will get there. Uh, I do like him. I, I, I remember on a Thursday night in what October, whatever, I was watching PSV play Arsenal. I don't know, it was a bit of a depleted Arsenal team, whatever. But he looked a really good player. Took up good positions, decisive, you know what I mean. And 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 he he wants to get in. He wants to score goals, isn't it? so. I'm not overly worried about. You know, some people are saying, is this a dud? And I'm going based on what you know. He's come into a situation where. You know, we're all we're all swimming against the tide a little bit at the moment, isn't it? So don't expect him to come in and be able to change it on his own, isn't it? So I agree with the the, the, the Dutch uh, football expert. It, it 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 was he the boy was also ready to go for him to take the next step, isn't it? So so I think we'll both benefit from this move. Yeah, I, I'd agree there. I think it is. It's in, in everyone's in everyone's uh, um, favour. I think uh, we should start putting a little bit of shape on the end of the show and looking at what's to come up. And we've uh, just have a look at the fixtures. I mean, holy <laughs> wolves! If you, I, I, I hope people don't um, have any aversion to wolves because uh, I have news for them. We have uh, quite a few uh, visits. Um, we've just gotten over the back of the. To all um, today, the replay was um, scheduled and penciled in for Tuesday of next week, the seventeenth of January. Uh, we have Chelsea um, on the Saturday after that, and guess who we play on the Saturday after that? Only Wolves uh, at Molyneux again. And the next two games against Wolves are at Molyneux. We have a game at Brighton uh, at the weekend, and we'll speak about them in a second. Um, but. I mean, the the run is quite relentless now, Jan. Uh, there is there are gaps, but at the same time, we could have done without that replay for sure. There would have been a full week between games, which is a nice luxury that we could do it at this time of the year. But the replay now means that that's gone. So we got Brighton, like I say, then on the Tuesday night, it's it's Wolves. Then on the Saturday, it's Chelsea. There is a gap till the following Saturday where we play Wolves again. Um, on the Monday. Uh, the 13th, so a week and a half then, there is a game against uh, Everton at home at Anfield. We then play Newcastle, and before you know it, it is Champions League uh, home tie against Real Madrid and finishing the month out against Crystal Palace. Now, that's a hell of a run, and normally you'd be licking your lips, and in, since the advent of this show, we'd have been sitting here going, okay, fantastic, let's look forward to these games, and with the best will in the world, we can give some time to talking about the opposition, but the the standard line, if we do our thing, we're going to be okay. Nobody can have that feeling at the moment, and Brighton have really put it up to us in the past. Um, this fixture on Saturday at their place, 
all of a sudden it has this tremendous feeling of a potential banana skin. And I don't know about you, but I resent the hell out of that, man. I really just resent it. How can we How can we be here? Uh, and it's why I think, you know, the, the, the feel-good factor of a couple of big signings would really uh, make a difference here as well uh, to the club going forward. But let's just deal with this fixture for what it is and we'll have a quick look forward to the to the FA Cup to finish. Um, the Brighton game, um, what do you make of them as a side? Uh, what, they're, what they're trying to do there? I mean, like I said to you, they have the measure of us for sure and have had in recent years. What do you think of this fixture in terms of a potential um, uh, for victory? There's nothing about that fixture I like, Trevor. <laughs> Whatsoever. Uh, I know that <laughs> The other week they played Arsenal at home and got beat 4 2. But I think it was a good time to play Brighton because Caseda was suspended and McAllister wasn't back from the World Cup. They've now returned. They're a totally different team. So, as I said, there's, there's nothing about this fixture that I like. They'll be 100% ready for us. Uh, they've got a lot of players. They've got a lot of players in good form. They're really good in possession. They find openings. They have in the past struggled a little bit by scoring goals, is the ball. I think they might have put that right, isn't it? So don't ask a prediction to him. I, don't, I just don't have <laughs> what's a potential banana skin, isn't it? But they are a really, really good team, Brighton. Yeah, and just to put it into context, that 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 four two reversal at Arsenal before that they had beaten Southampton three one. Immediately after that, they beat Everton four one, and in the FA Cup there at the weekend, they beat uh, Middlesbrough five one. So they're they're no slouches, and as you say, they're back to something resembling their full strength, uh, if not actually at it. Um, Caicedo and Gross nominally they're doing a job in midfield for them. They've got that Sarmiento lad, uh, Sully March and Miltoma head. Uh, Ferguson, Evan Ferguson, who's actually uh, my best mate's neighbour uh, playing up top. Uh, they're the last couple of games, a uh, young Irishman. Um, Colwell and uh, Dung at the back and Feltman and a Stupinen at full back positions. Um, it's a very solid side, and when you look at their uh, depth chart, as it was on the bench there in the last game, they've got Alexis McAllister, uh, World Cup winner, Tariq Glampty, they've got Trossard, who's uh, clearly capable of doing us damage as well, Adam Lalana. Jesus, sometimes you look at these benches and you're thinking, I wouldn't mind that bench. Billy yeah. Gilmore, highly rated as well, and then they made it up with a couple of others, Andrew Moore and Jason Steele. That's not a bad squad at all, Jan. I mean, Jesus... <laughs> I understand what you're saying when you say there's nothing you like about it. Um, let's try and put a spin on it then. How do we counter that team? Because we went, in commas, strong in the FA Cup in a way that I, I don't know about you, but I, I would never have seen that being the 11. I, I was stunned that that was the 11. But so it was. And I don't see how we can pull out a much better team um against Brighton so I'm, I'm I'm assuming it's going to be something very similar to that starting 11 that goes against Brighton do you think we have enough in that is there any little tweaks you'd make to maybe counteract whatever strengths you see them as having well obviously their strength is 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 them in possession isn't it there's a lot of movement a lot of technically really good players we saw the game early on in the season at Anfield 3-3 uh, where, where they caused us problems from everywhere uh, running down the flanks running through the middle uh, they'll do exactly the same again. Uh, is there anything we can do? Yeah, we can drop 10 yards. Uh, that's what I would do. Drop really? 10 yards. Yeah, I would drop 10 yards and then defend the edge of the box and see how we can get away with that. I think if we go and play open, I, I fear for this game big time. Do you think um, dropping 10 yards might actually put the likes of Joel and um, uh, Ibu Kanate maybe in their wheelhouse because they just got to win their battles, win their headers, be dominant in that area. The fullbacks would need to probably do a bit more concentration on, 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 on the running or certainly the lads ahead of them will have to cover for those runs if they go forward. Is it, I heard your, and Jürgen, by the way, I, it was interesting, said in his, one of his most recent pressers there, we need to um, concentrate on winning our individual Battles, right? Tackles and win each win each challenge. I thought that was strange because he seems to be suggesting that that's a, 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 a current failing. Um, with the idea of dropping, 
which is anathema to 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 to, to Klopp. Oh, he doesn't like it. He he loves that high line. And we've used it so well, yeah. I mean, you and I have defended it because we, the, the the players have been so excellent at it. We we catch teams offside twice as much as anybody else, um, and it's been a strength for us. But now it's a weakness for sure, and everyone's targeting the run in behind. So, do do we have the personnel? I guess that's what I was getting at with the original question. Is there any tweaking you'd make there? Would there be an argument for playing an, a third centre half for a while? Or is it, I mean, what what you know? Just I'm just spitballing here with you. Is there anything we can do to solidify ourselves for a period of time like that? I would be amazed if if, if Jurgen ever chose to go with three centre halves, especially in a time where where Virgil is unavailable, uh, and you probably feel that he would sort of be the leader if we're going to play with a three. So. I would find that I would actually find it amazing if Jurgen did anything different to what we normally do. You know, I, I think we'll still set up the way that we do. We'll try and press them. We'll try and impose ourselves on the game. I mean, that's that's been the big thing from when Jurgen came and we talked about heavy metal football to the way that we play now, isn't it? The big change has been control, hasn't it? We, we've been much better at controlling games, isn't it? We can't control games anymore. You know, hence that, that we're so vulnerable, isn't it? So, but I'm. To be honest, I'd be amazing if we do anything different to what we normally do, and and that's why I fear the game as much as I do. Yeah, uh, we'll come back as much as you don't want to to uh, prediction right at the end. But just to give a few words to the FA Cup, um, and circle back to that point I made a second ago. Okay, he went strong. That to me is a statement in and of itself. I wa- I, I worried. I'll be honest with you. I worried if it was a statement that. Well, the season's potentially screwed, uh, and it, it, here's a chance for us uh, to get another trophy, and um, we should go strong. Um, that might be daft thinking on my part, but it also might have played a part in the psychology uh, of of the manager beforehand. With it being a replay, and with it being sandwiched between two very important Premier League games, which surely take precedence, you would imagine. You would imagine. Um, do you see him going as strong again uh, for for the Wolves game? And if not, is there anyone putting their hand up and saying, "Well, look, I, I think you know that you'd say should get a run uh, for sure." I can't see any of the players who don't normally play where you think he deserves to get a run out. Uh, it, it would be strange if we didn't go strong again. We, we went strong in the first game, mm. but then you think. Our next two F- FA Cup games potentially is Wolves away and Brighton away. So is he also looking and thinking, you know, do we want to go down to Brighton and 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 play our strongest? I I really don't know. Of course, the two Premier League games should take preference, is there? But I'm a bit like at the moment is that we go with what we got in every game, and it will have to or it won't have to. It either works or it doesn't work, is the problem. Let's not hide behind fixture pile ups and blah blah whatever. Let's go for it and see what it takes. At least then when the season's finished, you can look back and go, listen, we did everything. We didn't try and be clever or cute about anything. And it went flat out. We didn't quite get the business. So, but but I do think that. I think it might be a role reverse when we play Wolves. I've got a feeling they might go strong. Uh, mm-hmm. And we will go a little bit weaker than what we did in the first game. I'm going to throw googly at you here for just one minute. We don't need to get into any depth on this at all. But you are lucky enough to be... Um, able to observe the matches at close quarters um, from the vantage point of being in the ground on a regular basis. And it's something that most of us don't unfortunately have. And so I wanted to ask you a question to go back to a a point that we mentioned early on about Mo Salah and Mo Salah's form. And it's almost, you know, with some people, it's like you never criticise Mo. You know, all the fanboys come out and they, they don't want to hear it. And they'll start pointing to stats and runs and whatever and honestly I don't care it's it's like um, as the season was winding down last year I was saying well, we need Mo Salah to be at his very best he wasn't and as, as a result I think as a result we have left less trophies uh, it, I think it's as simple as that because that guy's so bloody good he can he can win games on his own um, he doesn't appear to be in that type of form and one of the theories Jan like I say just to get a quick feedback from you, is that he is a little bit marooned out on the flank and that that is the way we seem to be playing him as a winger as opposed to allowing him to drift centrally and be in those central areas more often. Does that actually pan out when you're watching the games? Because I've heard this theory and yet 
I'm watching him and he seems to be involved centrally on, on a regular basis. Do you see that when you're watching the game? Is he kind of getting chalk on the boots a lot? And is, is that, is, does it seem to be a deliberate ploy uh, and a little bit different than what he used to? Or, or, or is that like just someone making that theory up? Again, yeah, you, you can't be 100% sure. Uh, but it, it does look like he doesn't take part in the game as fluent as he used to. He had this unbelievable ability to get involved in the game when he needed to, to unbelievable impact. I mean, if you want to defend him, it's easy to defend him, isn't it? Because you, you turn up at the stats and go, well, look, he's still scoring, he's still making assists, isn't it? But as a whole, and that impact, and also the impact it has on the opposition, isn't it? You know, when Moe's at it for 95 minutes, I mean, how lively and on your toes do you need to be? And that's no longer the case. So I almost sit... And watch Liverpool play. And then, oh, there he is. And then he goes again for 10 or 12 minutes, you know. And then, oh, he appears again, isn't it? But it's, it's like a little brief cameo. And sometimes it ends up with a goal, isn't it? But there isn't that involvement in the game. And I always think that and it's going back to when I played with Johan Cruyff, isn't it? And he was always on about, you know, your better players need to be involved because they're the only ones who can sort of lift it. And I just think he's making like almost like guest appearances. Uh, the guest appearance more often than not is too very effective and he gets his goal, he got his goal against Wolves and whatever, isn't it? But is it enough? And it probably isn't. Yeah, I think that's fair. So with the two games ahead before we chat again, what's your gut feeling on how they go? First of all, Brighton in the league? My, my gut feeling is that we'll lose the game at Brighton. Uh, and I, and I, I don't know whether that's the first or not for the podcast, Trevor, but, but that's how I feel. I, I just think that they're ideally suited to, to playing against us because of the qualities that they have. Uh, it'll be tight. Uh, you know, we're vulnerable. We can see goals 2 1, 3 2. Uh, but I do, as I said before, I don't like this game at all. Yeah, it's remarkable. I think it might actually be a first. And that says an awful lot about the wonderful run that we've had and the form that we've had to be able to talk about. With the suggestion that you put out there that Wolves may go stronger and we may not go quite as strong, how are you feeling about that game in the FA Cup? Do you see us progressing there? Yeah, it wouldn't surprise me if it goes all the way. Uh, I mean, Wolves, although they had a few chances, and you generally struggle uh, scoring goals. It wouldn't surprise me if if if, if that's a goal, uh, sorry, a game that goes all the way and ends up with with, with penalties. And and we know what happens if winning a penalty shootout. There's only one winner, isn't it? So I, I can actually see us making progress in the FA Cup. Yeah, and as you said, then only to face Brighton. <laughs> so, the fun. Uh, that's a fantastic, Jan. Uh, that's eight o'clock. We should let you get back to your evening. Uh, so, on behalf of everyone, it's great to have you back uh, and thanks very much for the show. Yeah, it's nice to be back, isn't it? You know, it's, 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 it's still there to be enjoyed, Trevor, isn't it? You know what I mean, it just isn't as easy as it has been for the last four and a bit years, isn't it? But we have to dig in. We have to, to trust that people that are leading our club can find the right solutions and we can go again. 100%. And uh, Jan and myself will do our best to go again between now and the end of the season and bring you whatever happiness and joy we can. And even if it's bad, we will have a laugh. Don't worry about that. We'll try and focus on the positive stuff or what might be. So for now, uh, this has been Malby in the spot. I'm Trev Downey. You heard Jan Malby. We'll speak to you soon. <laughs>